Would you bow your heads with me as we pray, and I will not waste your time. Father, it is in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, our Savior, the one who has been created in your very image. He is the express image of your person. The likeness can be seen from every life that's been transformed by his power in this room. Father, I thank you that you have anointed us, the church, the body of Christ, for such a time as this. There is nobody greater than anybody else in this room. The one who we ascribe our glory and all of our honor to, his name, your name is Jesus. So we thank you. We invite your, your presence, your anointing that would come and destroy yokes and remove burdens in this room tonight. We thank you, God, that somebody was desperate to get here. And it didn't matter if Jerry Savelle or anybody else was speaking. They just need to hear a word from you. Father, I just release the angels of the Lord right now, Holy Spirit, as you would minister and orchestrate their touch and their service tonight as they stand on guard over this place. Let your people be glorified by the delivery of the word. Father, we thank you that they will be edified by the delivery of the word and that you will be glorified by the same delivery of the word and that our enemy, your enemy, Satan, Lucifer, the devil, will be absolutely horrified that the people of God are in the presence of God once again, and he can't do anything about that. So we bind the spirit of the enemy, we bind distractions, and we allow your people to hear freely from heaven what thus saith the Lord today, tonight. If you agree with that prayer, would you say amen? amen. Turn to your neighbor and say, now listen, he talks fast. Don't, don't fall asleep. You're going to miss some, and he might be standing in front of you when you open your eyes. Amen. <laughs> Glory to God. We at LifePoint like to have fun. I told them this morning, I tell them all the time that, man, growing up in church was an unpleasant experience in many ways. Oh, my goodness. Somebody can say amen to that. Our dad was a preacher, and he was... Many times, you know, the, I don't, well, I better not say that because that might offend. Pull your religious toes in, okay? I, I'm, I'm going to say it three times. That's one. Pull your religious toes in, okay? What I mean by that is no offense. We telling truth, amen? If you can't say amen, say ouch. So my dad would sit up on the, on the rostrum as it was, and he'd be up there. And so he would be there, and we would be out in the audience with my mom. And we were like stair steps. I mean, my brother's telling about the picture today. You know, we are the, the youngest of eight, so we are seven and eight. He's seven, I'm eight. How you doing, seven? All right. So many times I think my dad couldn't remember my name. Eight, come here. No, I'm just kidding. He was, but anyway, but he had this ability in his distance of sitting up here and us being out there to look at us and stop the blood from flowing in your veins. He had that daddy look. Some of y'all don't know what that daddy look is, but he had that dad look. And my mom's the, the most, as a kid, I told you, it was just hard for me to be in church. And so when, when you know, you're trying to not be antsy and fidgety, you know, you know what I'm talking about, elders, and you're trying to keep the cops, be quiet, sit down. At that time, we didn't have no children's church. This was children's church. And then they'd make you come up front and say something. You couldn't sit back and do nothing. So I hated it. And so I can remember, you know, if we get in trouble enough, my mom would say, I, I'm going to tell your daddy. Those were the words that just stopped all movement, man. You know? She, you know, I mean, but, but what I found was that the message, and as I began to grow up and began to become, you know, as an adolescent, I began to realize that the words that they were telling were truth. Because it was coming out of the Bible. Yeah. I mean, isn't the Bible truth? Yeah. Y'all sound like y'all don't know that. <laughs> this thing right here, what I think there's, listen, I think there's 66 books in there, something like that. I've heard it. I, you, that, right? <laughs> Last time we checked, there's 66. We didn't take any out, did we? But, but the book that I heard and that they thumped, you know, our, our parents were Pentecostal, Amen. strict holiness. And because of that, we couldn't go to parties. Amen. Better not go near a party. 
All the, all the, the holy, whole, all the drinking we did was in church. And I ain't talking about the, 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 the communion wine because we didn't have that. We had grape juice. And it was unfermented, so you wasn't going to get high. You know? So they told us that if you wore this, you were a sinner. If you dressed like this, you were a sinner. All this stuff that just, man, it just, it wasn't, wasn't working. It's hard to do. Many of us in this day and age could not live under those type of, you know, rules and regulations. And so... As a kid coming up, my, the last thing I wanted to do was go to church. So we would go to church meeting. Now, my brother's been preaching since, well, has been ordained since he's four, 14. I won't tell you how old he is. Doesn't matter. He don't care, but I'm just not going to tell you. That's his business. But, but with that being said, at 14, I was doing stuff that I shouldn't have been doing. I used to get him in trouble, he said. Amen. Mom and dad would come upstairs and say, where's Tommy? And Tommy had slipped out the window at 14, 13. I'd go to church on a Friday night. Now, you know you're not really spiritual unless you go to church on a Friday night, right? And Tuesday. And twice on Sunday. Sometimes, huh? You know what I'm saying? Three hours. Be a long service on Sundays. So what I'm saying to you, though, is that in the process of my development, there were two it was a dichotomy, as it were, but there were two things maturing at the same time. It wasn't just my natural man that was growing up, very roughly, I might say. It's kind of a challenge. I put my dad through some stuff. You know, one night I can remember I stayed out all, well, I stayed out all weekend. Now, she knows I'm not going to say anything that's revelatory to her, okay? She's been with me a long time. She, we cleared all this up when we, before we got married. Some of y'all need to clear some stuff up before y'all get married. That way there won't be any surprises later on. Oh, I'm preaching better than y'all saying. That's okay. So I spent the whole weekend out. I was still in high school. We didn't have cell phones. What was a cell phone? And so I was out all weekend. <laughs> well, welcome to the family. Anyway, I was out all weekend, and, and I didn't come home until... Um, Sunday late, Sunday night late, and I left on a Thursday. And my mom and dad had no clue as to where I was. And I ain't telling you where I was. Ain't none of your business, because you ain't going to tell me where you were. And so I came home. I'm telling you, I got, I'm going somewhere now. I came home, but before I came home, I knew how to get into the church that was in, in another part of town. So I, you know, they got them windows, you know, different style windows. Well, I could get in the church even when I didn't want to be in the church and with nobody else in the church. So I got in the church, I snuck in the church and went to the office and picked up the phone. And I didn't call home. I called a hotline and said, I'm scared. Now, I wasn't scared the whole Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and all day Sunday. But I was scared on Sunday night. Because at some point, there was going to be a reckoning. At some point, listen to me now, at some point I knew I had to go home, say home. home. And I'm telling every unbeliever out there, everybody out there that's backslidden or feel like you don't need God, at some point you're going to have to come home. I called him, called that hotline, that hotline called my daddy's house. Uh-huh, it was worse than that. Called my daddy's house, Lord Jesus. I'll never forget this. And he said, well, told, this is what the counselor told me. He said, tell him to come home. He's my son. Tell him to come home. So I went home. Counselor said, listen, listen now, because I'm going somewhere. Counselor said, if he does anything to you, let us know. Now, I, now wait a minute. Now, that was 1976, 77. It ain't like it is. Now, I'm, I'm very conservative. I'm just going to say that up front for all y'all liberals in here, okay? My daddy used a belt. You may not like it. It may be against the law, but my daddy used a belt. And when my daddy, look, I don't care what y'all say. This is how we were raised. It was a cultural thing. And when I got too big for him to put a belt on, he, he, he could raise up like this. And our daddy was a big man now. He didn't play. And so I went home. <laughs> we lived, we lived, 
I don't know how long, about 15 minute walk? The walk took an hour, Jack. I was, <laughs> my feet were stuck to the cement, man, to the sidewalk. And I walked into the house, had to come in the front door, couldn't sneak in back, get up, you know, because they already knew I wasn't there, so there wasn't no sneaking back in. Oh, how you get here, you know? <laughs> I went inside, and my father met me at the stairs, on the stairs. We had this little incline, it's little stairs to go up. And he said something to me that I'm going to say to you. He said, I love you. He said, but I will not let you embarrass me, or I will not let you not have my love. He said, my love, you're going to feel this one. Now, I thought he meant, he didn't mean that. What he, what he said to me probably was one of the most significant emotional events in my maturation growing up. He said to me something that resonated to me that I'm telling you now, that in the process of all of your immaturity, in the process of all of our insecurities, in all of our fickleness, and we're faithful one minute, not faithful the next, whatever that looks like, Whatever that happens, however it happens, it does happen. God is never, ever going to let you do what you want to do without there being consequences to what you do. Now, stop thinking that all the consequences are going to be bad. Some of the consequences of what we choose to do instead of what God wants us to do sometimes cause us to get outside of his will. God, help me. And when we get outside of his will, we have to find our way back. While his loving arms stand there and say, come on home, son. Come on home, daughter. And so my dad took something from me that was very important to me. I was a basketball player. I was very gifted at playing basketball when I was in high school. And he took my basketball uniform, put it on a hanger, hung it up, kicked me off the team. He told the coach, if he walks, if he breathes air from the gym, I'm suing the school. He called the school and told them that. Do not let him in the gym. He can't even play during, during recess or during gym class. He was serious because what he was doing was he was taking something that I held in high esteem. And he was letting me know that what you did was wrong. I don't, he didn't want to know what I did. Like, God really don't care what you did. It's religious people that care what you did. And when religious people care what you did, they usually get in the way of God's ability to bless you. So, so, so he didn't care what I did, but rather he gave me a reminder constantly that I needed to do better. And so, when, listen, when the gospel that he was preaching didn't hit my life the way it should, his messages many times did. Now, that's how some of us are. Some of us, many times, you know, we come in and you hear preachers, and I heard that before. Ain't too much in this book that you haven't heard if you've been in, if you've been in, in, in God very long. You've heard most of it. And there's still a lot we haven't heard. I'm not trying to suggest that we've, we've arrived anywhere, but what I'm telling you is that God's message, if, it, if, if you can't read, if you can't see, if you can't hear for whatever reason, God will send somebody to open the blinded eyes, open deaf ears, and get the message across to your heart because the Bible says that he has hidden eternity in our hearts. So we are without excuse when it comes time for God to say, listen, I choose you. And if we're out of position because we've been disobedient, it's time for us to get back in position and just come on home. Say, come on home. So I'm going to invite you tonight to, to go with me to the scripture. And I won't be in front of you very long. This is what the Lord laid on me. And I got to tell you, it's kind of hard to preach behind this man for one. He and I have never preached together in the same, say, in the same setting. Never, never done. First time in, in my 27 years of ministry and his 40 plus. Delighted to be able to do that. But I so didn't like the idea of me having to stand up here in place of Dr. Savell. But I also know, yeah, I said show. I also know who I am in Christ. Come on now. And because I know who I am, I have all authority to speak the word of God from a level that will bless your life if you let it in. Amen. So turn with me to the book of Acts. I'm going to do some reading tonight, and hopefully you'll be able to stay awake. The ushers are prepared to pour water on you if you don't. <laughs> Just kidding. Don't get mad. Don't throw nothing. I'll be ducking and dodging up here if you do. Acts, praise God, the 14th chapter. Acts 14. And I've got... How many of you have ever heard of the message translation? 
Brother Jerry was the first person I ever heard use the message translation. And I like it. I also have the expanded Bible here that I'm going to use. I like this Bible, so I'm going to use it. So if I don't read from King James, y'all won't get too mad, will you? All right. If you do, too bad. Get over it. <laughs> Be like Miss Gloria Copeland. Just get over it. All right. Verse 1, Acts 14, if you have it, say amen. In Iconium, Paul and Barnabas went as usual to the Jewish synagogue. They spoke so well that a great many Jews and Greeks believed. But the Jews who did not believe excited Gentiles uh, and excited the Gentiles and turned them against the believers. Hmm, that sounds familiar. Paul and Barnabas stayed in Iconium a long time and spoke bravely for the Lord. He showed that their message, listen, about his grace was true by giving them the power to work miraculous signs and miracles or wonders. But, verse 4 says, the city was divided. Look up at me for a minute. How many of you live in communities that are divided over the word of God? Whether Jesus, they're still debating whether Jesus is real or not real. We need to settle that question amongst this group of believers tonight. I applaud the pastors that are here. I applaud you guys for taking the time to come because pastors are, churches are some of the most divided places on the planet. I'm delighted that LifePoint has a diverse enough crowd that you can't, even as you look around, you can't tell who's a part of LifePoint and who's not unless you know them. But that's intentional by the Holy Ghost. But it says here that the, the, the message about his grace was true. And how did they do that? Because the Lord gave them the power to work signs and miracles. But the city was divided. Again, verse 4. Some of the people agreed with the Jews and others believed the apostles. So we got a real conflict going on here. Verse 5 says some Gentiles, some Jews, and some of their rulers wanted to mistreat Paul and Barnabas and to stone them to death, wanted to kill them. Can I say this? That in this society that we live in, my wife and I live right here in the local area. We moved here from Texas, originally from New York, New York State. And so with that, though, I recognize that the day is coming in our lifetime, potentially for many of us, that people in the community who will not receive your message and who feel like you are a threat to their safety simply because you believe in Jesus will try to do things that are despicable, dastardly, and deadly if they can to you and I. You don't have to agree with, with, with other religions. And I'm not being disparaging now, okay? I want you to hear what I'm saying. But that, when we've got the enemy coming into our churches and sitting back and shooting up believers and taking people out simply because they, come, they say that I love Jesus, that is too much territory for the devil to have. Amen. Amen. And we as a church need to have a backbone. Amen. We, need to, we need to just stop coming to church and talking about faith, but we need to put faith to, to, the, to the test. Amen. Come on, somebody. Amen. So what they did to them, they'll try to do to you. Let's keep going. So when Paul, verse 6, Paul and Barnabas learned about this, they ran away. Some of y'all too deep to run away. I ain't running. Well, when the Holy Ghost tells you that they wouldn't have run if the Holy Ghost hadn't told them that. Amen. Amen. I better go to this side because I ain't get. <laughs> they wouldn't have run if the Holy, not, not, not these two. And that's why in this church in particular, we teach people you have to know the voice of the Holy Ghost. Got to know his voice. The most important lesson you will learn after salvation is to be in the presence of the Holy Spirit. Amen. To allow him to come into you and fill you up and talk through you and to you and minister the truth of God's word. Amen. So he says here that they, they ran. I, thought, I like the way he puts this, you know, to Lystra. And so it goes on to say, and it was about 18 miles to the south of where they were, and to Derby, which was 60 miles, right? And the city's in Lyconia. Verse 7 uh, and to those areas around, around to those cities. They announced, verse 7, the good news or preached the gospel there too. So they didn't just run to be running. They ran because the message still had to be preached. Amen. And so when I look at Dr. Savelle's inability to come, what we found out when, I, when we called him yesterday, we found out that, and, and I think Linda confirmed this, they had been on the road 10 days, correct? They've been traveling 10 days. Not on the road, he flies, but 10 days. 
So it's no wonder that these things might have caught up to, look, I, you know, as much as I love Brother Copeland, as much as I love Brother Jerry and all of them, we go to minister's conference, let me tell you something. They are men and women of God, Billy Brim. They have to get up every morning, put their clothes on, make a decision that they're going to continue to preach the message of faith even when people don't want to hear it. And really, most especially when people don't want to hear it. I remember hearing Pastor George Pearson say this one year. We were up there in Texas, and, and he said something so profound. It just blessed me. He said, you know, we've gotten to the point where we don't want to give time to the Holy Ghost to move. My God. we become so professional in what we do that you got, preacher, you got 15 minutes to move me. And it's never been, this has never been a business of entertainment. Help us, God, when we turn the pulpit into a palace and somehow or another, the person up here is the star of stars. There is only one star. The Bible says there is only one faith, one Lord and one baptism, yes. and one Lord of all. His name is Jesus. Yes. And he will not share. He don't mind sharing his glory with you, but he ain't going to let you take it. Yeah. Let's keep going. Y'all right? Yeah. Hallelujah. So, again, they ran. They preached the good news there, too. But here's what I want to get to. I am just told you I was going to read a little bit. In Lystra, verse 8, there sat a man who had been born crippled. It says, from the womb of his mother. He had never walked. Now listen to this. He had never walked. As this man was listening, I circled that in my Bible, listening to Paul speak, Paul looked straight at him and saw that he believed. Why is it that in today's church, we think we can't see faith on somebody? When you were up here a couple months ago, you know, this is a, this is a wild dude, man. Y'all want a funny guy to come to your church, this is the one, right? Because he don't pull, the, he don't pull no punches. He tells the truth. But he was up here, and you could just see, see that the, the faith and the power of God was all over him. When he preached this morning, he was, he was kind of reserved for how he normally is, but he was giving his testimony along with giving the word. But I'm going to tell you something. We should be able to see faith on one another. We shouldn't be the people that go, people come to, they need us. They come to knock on these pastors. I know, I know, I ain't been pastor probably nowhere near as long. I've been pastor nine years, but I know, my God, I sat next to this man for so long, sat next to Brother Jerry for a while, I thought pastor was something different than it is. <laughs> pastor's one of the hardest jobs on the planet. No, no offense to the apostles, prophets, teachers, uh -huh, and evangelists. But in this society, people have gotten more information from YouTube and Facebook than they have from the word of God. Yeah. And you come to a meeting like this, ain't nothing but power. And it's how I feel, I can sense the presence of God right now. Yeah. And you come into a place that has been prepared. I don't care if it's a hotel. Long as we hear it belongs to God. Yeah. When we walk on the grounds, we speak faith. Yeah. People come and they're, they're, they're bowed over with sin and sickness and disease. And we want to sit away from them. Yeah. Want to move down a little bit. Uh, excuse me. Come on now. We got to recognize that this power, the same power that was resident on Paul and Barnabas, I'm going to show you in a minute. These, for these people thought they were gods. And they were just men and women, in this case, men, anointed to do the work of God. Come on, say amen to that if you believe it. So he says here, the man cried out. Paul cried out. So he cried out and said with a loud voice, stand up on your feet. The Bible, my Bible doesn't say that the man kind of took his time, you know getting up because his, his, his joints was too bad. This lets us know his joints weren't working at all. When Paul walked up to him, he had no function in his feet. He was that way from his mother's womb. And we can't even get people like that in the door anymore because our churches have no power to heal. Look, they, they wonder. She don't because she know. You wonder why. I, look, I, I, I love, just like I love him, I love Dr. Savelle. But I, I, I've seen Dr. Savelle some very weak moments. And that's between him and God and me for what I saw. You got to learn that lesson. Because they're just men and women. You're waiting for your favorite preacher to come to town and lay hands on you when you got somebody who should be living in your house, your husband, your wife, your child, somebody. Somebody should be able to come to you and look you square in the face and say, be healed in the name of Jesus. Somebody. And our churches have become impotent and weak because we have sat back in the cut, as it were, just waiting for somebody to make me feel good. Play my worship song. Play my, we're playing songs for Jesus, baby, not you. People coming to the church and somebody agreeing with their sickness. 
Well, you know, God don't heal everybody. What Bible you reading? I look at this woman of faith. Gave me a testimony this morning. I ain't gonna put you on the spot. It's too late, did it? <laughs> Went back, healed of cancer. Wait a minute. Had to, had to go get another mammogram. Completely clear. Now, that ain't the best part. You know how she had to do it? She had to leave the old dead, dry church she was a part of. I've had, we've, had God, we've had God send people here who have been filled with cancer. Not all of them have been delivered, but we've certainly done our best to get them that way. You got to get people out of unbelief before you can get them in faith. Are y'all right? I get excited, so y'all have to, you can just take it. Anyway, glory to God. So it says the man jumped up and began walking around. He wasn't just satisfied. To, see, see, this is how a lot of us get. Now, 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 you, okay, this is number two. Pull your religious toes in. I got one more. Somebody help me out. Don't let me go beyond. We, we, we've gotten so, so content just to have a healing line and have somebody else lay their hands on us. And I'm not knocking it because I do that. I do do that. But I've come to understand something about God. And it has absolutely set me free. I was sitting in the service back in 2003 in the back of Heritage of Faith Christian Center and there was a gentleman by the name of Jerry Savelle preaching a message that made me mad. I mean, I mean, it lit my fire and not in a good way. You ever been mad at HFCC? They can... <laughs> it's okay to be mad. The Bible says be angry, but don't sin. I was angry, but I wasn't going to sin. I so was walking out that church, though, with the intent of never coming back. And I had just moved there. We just moved there to be there because God said, go there. How many of you ever been to Eagle Mountain? Anybody in here? Y'all don't travel enough. We, we wanted to go to Eagle Mountain on, on, the, on the grounds of KCM. We wanted to be a part of that ministry. God said, I want you there at, at Heritage of Faith. I drove up on the grounds of Heritage of Faith, ran and wasn't impressed, which should have been the first sign. Because why did I need to be impressed? Help me, God. So, so, so he, was, he was preaching that day, and he was preaching the, the faith series. Um, I, I, I remember the message. Uh, huh? Freedom, freedom series. Thank you. She was there, too. She didn't leave. When I got up to leave, she sat down. She's like, I done, we done played this record before. We're not going back to this chapter of our lives when we're going to leave God. We did that for a long time. So, so. Man, I tell you what, he was preaching, good preaching too. Now, I got, I got the series upstairs in my library in my house. And the, and the series was on freedom from religion. And I got to listening to that thing, and everything he said that people do, I was doing. That's why I was mad. He said people had to, listen, y'all, now I'm not going to say it because I'm not going to use my last one right now because I might need it for later. So y'all know what to do. But he said, if you, had to, if you got to pray with your eyes closed, you got to pray with your eyes closed, you might need deliverance or freedom from religion. Yeah. Don't shout me down when I'm preaching good. When he said, when you have to count to the very, first, the very dime of tithing, the very penny of tithing, you might need deliverance from religion. Ooh, I know that's it. Uh -huh. where, where Chris at? Where Chris at? That's a choke point there, baby. That we... It only says we have a tenth. But see, the freedom of God gives us the ability to exceed that and get into a realm of giving God everything. My God, he, he wants it all, but he's not going to take it all. He said, if you've, oh, uh, here we go. Some of y'all know what y'all walked into. But Jerry, where you at, man? Help me out. But if you got to wear a dress and can't wear pants as a woman, If a man, if a, if a preacher has got to wear, got to wear, got to wear a shirt and tie or a turned around collar, you might need deliverance from, well, I was doing all that except the dress part. <laughs> I got up to get out there at church because I was fuming, man. And I got to, if you've ever been to Heritage of Faith, it's got a small foyer, not, not very big. I got out there right there, out there where the desk is and I was going to walk out the door. She wasn't with me, so I figured, well, you know what? She'll find a ride home. I don't care. Of course, I knew better than that. I'd be sitting out in the parking lot because if I leave her, I'm going to really see some anger. <laughs> but I, before I got to the door, the Lord said, what's the problem? Not in an audible voice. I could hear it on the inside. Right. Why are you leaving? That's right. 
Did he touch a nerve? See, the word of God is not just designed to make you feel all warm and fuzzy and good. See, 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 the Bible says that the word is also given for rebuke and correction. We don't like to talk about that, but many of us shepherds, you know, sometimes you need to take out the rod of God in a gentle way and get your fanny back in there. And that's what the Holy Ghost did to me that day. He said, you need to hear what he's saying. Now, I say this to you. Because I was talking about the maturation process. See, at 14, 15, when I should have been developing myself in God. Oh, don't get quiet on me now. Ain't no condemnation. If you just found Jesus and you're 55, praise God. Who cares? The Lord will redeem the time. Come on now. My God, you know, this preacher's Wigglesworth didn't do much till he, till he turned 50 years old and passed. And couldn't read a lick until his wife taught him. Y'all don't hear what I'm saying. God doesn't care what, what you bring to the table. He just wants you to bring it to the table. <laughs> so, so I was growing up, and I'm going to tell you all something. No, no, don't get mad. Don't get mad. Turn to your neighbor and say, don't get mad. Turn to the other neighbor and say, he said, don't get mad. <laughs> Saying he's talking to me. Okay, so that means everybody if you said it. <laughs> And growing up, as God was raising me up as a young man, he had me in a great family. I had a great family. We had a great family. We had a great family. All my brothers and sisters still alive. And all of us, except all of us, are preaching the gospel. All of us. Every last eight of us. All of us, eight of us are preaching the gospel in some form or fashion. That's amazing. That's astounding. Nobody's turned their back on God. Everybody stayed there. And so, so anyway, I, I, was in, I was giving it the best run I could for not being one of the eight, but I made it. And so, so, as I was growing up, and then when I got out of high school, I had gone from, we have in New York State this thing called Regents. I don't know what they call the, you know, you know uh, the accelerated programs, AP program, they might call any teachers in here, you know what I'm talking about? Well, I was in that program. I was on track to go to any college. My brother went to Wake Forest, you know, and I had offers from various schools to come play basketball, and I had squandered it so badly that by the time it came time for me to get out of high school, I had to go to summer school just to graduate. Now, I wasn't nobody's dummy, but I was lazy, undisciplined, amoral, immoral, selfish, full of Tommy Roberts with the capital T and the O-M-M-Y, all in caps. Like y'all know some of those people y'all used to be. I said you used to be, you're not that way anymore. But it was all about me, even at a young age. And I told my wife this. She knows I, I, I don't lie. I ain't trying to lie to you. I got no reason to lie to you because I'm going to heaven. Because all liars don't go, to, they don't go to heaven. Not unless they repent. Anyway. And so uh, I told my wife, I said, you know, it, it's probably a good thing that I did not get a PhD. Especially without God. Because I would not be standing here tonight. I would be doing whatever I wanted to do because my life was all about me. And I applaud, again, every servant, man or woman of God in here who have given your life over to the Lord to do his work, do his will, because I know how tough you have it. And your people will never know, so stop expecting them to know. When you get up to preach and you feel in the weight of the ministry, you get up there and you've had a rough day and things have not gone your way, God expects you to get up. I heard Bill Winston say this. He said, you come in the building looking like a general of the faith. He said, you stand with your, your Mark Barkley. Boy, that's, that's a bad boy there. He said, you come, you stand erect. You are the messenger of God. You give it to them whether they want to hear it, in season, out of season. You make sure that what you stand and tell them is straight from the throne of God. And as a leader, many times, it's just not easy. People have unrealistic expectations. And I had one of my father. That's why I'm saying all that. He preached his heart out, man. He preached as long as he could, trying to reach people like me and couldn't even reach somebody. Many times we get out here and we do this message and we do this thing and people in our own house aren't serving the Lord. Jesus. People look at you, well, you know, if your own people, your own family ain't serving the Lord, it doesn't it say who you all desires to offer a bishop must have his own house in order? Well, I ain't asked for all that. And my dad didn't ask for all that. So one day, one day, as I was growing up, kind of like this, I got to a place where I couldn't take 
the infancy, listen to me, the infancy of my soul any longer. Many people are out there and their souls are underdeveloped. Their spirit has the potential to be a giant. But without God, it's weak. If you could see the inside, a dead spirit is just that. There's no life there other than that which simply comes from being a human being. That's what differentiates us from the animals. So as a, as a, a person who does not have Jesus, and I'm listen to me, y'all might not like it, but I'm going to say it. You, have the, you are the one responsible for the development of your own soul, not God. Amen. He's taking care of the spirit part. The body is, in, is under his control, but you got to give him something to work with. You can't, you can't go out and eat Twinkies and Munchos all day long and expect to lose any weight. At some point, that stuff going to start getting in your system and getting in your arteries, and you just go out here and do whatever you do. See, that's what I was doing, and I didn't know it. And it was killing me from the inside out. When, I met, when she met me, man, she, when I met her, I knew that was my wife. 19 years old. I said, that's mine. That's exactly what I said. And all them chumps that were standing out there that she knew. You ever heard that song, So Long Bye Bye? They had to step aside because I was here now. But what, listen, what she thought she, God help me, what she thought she had, she did not have because she didn't know that I was really an infant on the inside. And no matter how well developed my mind was, my spirit was not in, in, in any way, shape, or form strong enough to pull my soul up because there was nothing there. You do know what your soul is. What, you, what is your soul? Your mind, will, and emotions. And the body of Christ suffers from weak souls. You come up, I know his church, I ain't even going to go there because I know him. I know his wife Kay. And I know the way he teaches. I know what he teaches. I've been around him for two days. I know how he, I, can, I just know it all. He over here calling up, growing out legs and limbs and binding the spirit and input. Come on, somebody. But let me tell you something. You better latch on to that kind of thing because without it, yes. 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 so when I married her, I was looking all good. Six foot, five, six foot, six feet and fine. I'm talking about me, not her. Or so I thought. Six foot, two and fine is good when you 19. But when you 47 and you still having to baby that man, you still trying to carry that woman and she ain't put nothing in her to help you along. And I don't, I don't mean no harm, but there's a lot of church folks that ain't got nothing in them. They're just sitting there filling up a spot. And if you needed to lay hands on somebody, you'd be too scared because you think it's all about you. It's not about you. You are the vessel that God uses. you got to allow yourself to be filled up with his presence. And if you fill yourself up, he, look, he don't care where you go, how you look. He might just say, daughter, be healed in Jesus' name. Come on, somebody. We want to know the Greek and the Hebrew. Most of them can't even spell it. I'm not exempt. Let me keep going. I'm, I'm boring, y'all. Let me, let me hurry up. He, he says here, he says here, let, let, let me go back. In Lystra, there sat a man who had been born crippled. Now, he was this way. All of us have been born crippled, y'all. I'm not talking about in this physical house. Just like he said, one way or another. We've all been born crippled. And, and the problem with the pulpit and the pews is that the pulpit forgets that they were once crippled. So they run around telling you stuff that they get out of seminary and the formula don't work unless it comes from the Holy Ghost. Your seminary ain't never got, your Bible college, your Bible school ain't never got nobody healed. And you can't come up here and act like you got something in you because when you open your mouth, and all these men, and, and y'all too, the men and women of God get up here and they start realizing this, this chump ain't gay. This, this, who is this fool? <laughs> ain't no confirmation, ain't no signs, ain't no wonders, ain't no healings, ain't no deliverance, ain't no finances coming in. Come on, all this stuff follows what we do. Signs, wonders, miracles. Well, I wanted Brother Jerry to tell me that. He just did. By the Holy Ghost, he just did. 
I did not want to do this. I'm, I, I did not want to do this. But I sure ain't shy. Because in my underdevelopment, man, I almost lost my life. 19, I had a rifle in my mouth. 19. Before I met her. Distraught. 19. Our teenagers are taking their own lives, watching stupid stuff like 13 Reasons on Netflix. And we as the believers, the body of Christ, don't even have enough integrity to write, the, to write them and say, stop it. Thank God for places like AFA. One million moms. Some of y'all don't even know what I'm talking about. Who stand up and say, that's wrong. And our babies, they, that's why we don't play church here. We don't play church, baby church when we got the kids. My God, if, if judgment begins at the house of God and there's a generation that grows up that doesn't know God, are we the ones responsible for them not knowing God? My kids ain't that old. I mean, you know, I look young, but we, we had him when we were 21 years old. Strong young man of God. Bright future. But I went to him and told him not too long ago when we were over in Tiffin, I said, man, you got to make a decision because God is taking his ministry somewhere. Either you in or you out. I ain't going to play with him. Eternity is too long. How are you going to be on the outside of the kingdom and, 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 be, and, and remember the day that they made an altar call and you were too stubborn to answer? And I know, I know, I know. We go to churches, man, where they don't, they, they, they don't want to, they don't want to ruffle any feathers because you might not come back. Look, if you don't come back no more, Jesus. if you sit in one of these services, you're gonna hear the truth, and the truth will set you free. Say amen. Come on, give the Lord a hand of praise. Let me let me hurry up. I'm I'm running out of time. Let me I talk too much sometimes. Let me keep going. So they told him to stand up. The man jumped up and began walking around. Listen, when the crowd saw what Paul did, now first of all, Paul didn't do it. But wait, 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 before you say amen, before you say amen, before you jump on your doctrinal train that takes you and says that it, Paul was just a man, it is absolutely true. So we don't debate that. But Paul was a man who had an experience with God. And in his crippled state, his underdeveloped soul, he was, a, he was, the Bible says he was born the eighth day of the tribe of Benjamin. He was a Hebrew of the Hebrews. He was one of the most educated men to walk the planet on the day. But he was still crippled in his soul. And God had a plan for him. Enough to say to him, Paul, excuse me, Saul, Saul. Now it's one thing for God to speak to you once. But if somehow or another you didn't know it was God the first time, maybe you're like the prophet Samuel of old, listen, in his infancy, when he didn't know the voice of God and he had to go to a prophet and the prophet told him, listen, next time, he was smart enough to know that God was going to speak again. Help me, God. God will never, ever leave you without being able to hear his voice. If you don't hear him the first time, maybe you don't hear him the second time, maybe the third time is out. You keep staying right there because he's going to speak to you. Say again. Samuel told him, said, next time, boy. I mean, Eli told him next time. <laughs> yes, Lord, hear am I. And he was smart enough to do it. So Saul is on the Damascus road. We preach about it. But I think many times, you know, we kind of gloss over the real essence of the word because we don't see these men and women of God as being human beings like us. The man had to wash, hopefully, every day without the benefit of indoor plumbing, so to speak. The man had to put sandals on and if he was an educator as he was, he sat at the feet of an instructor by the name of Gamaliel, who was the highest order of priests and the best of schools. So if I could say it this way, I, I don't mean any harm, you of I, I'm not saying anything bad, but this was more along the line of Harvard for Paul. And it was important for him to re re recognize the school or his, his, his own ability. And isn't that what gets the church messed up more than anything else? We see us instead of seeing the God behind us or the God in us or the God in front of us. So Paul falls down. Saul falls down, comes up Paul. And God has got a purpose for him. So when he's standing out there, yes, he's just a man. 
but it is God in us. The Bible says that we have this treasure in earthen vessels. That the excellency of the power would be of who? God and not of man. Stand up, Steve. So when Steve stands up, stand up, man of God. When he stands up and he sits in the office, no matter what he looks like to you, God sees a servant of the highest caliber. And God sees a man who is trusted with the gospel. So that when he speaks, I don't want Steve to stand in front of me. I want the pastor. I want the pastor of beloved. I need somebody who's got a connection with God. And they will look me square in the eye and tell me, Tommy, stand up, boy. You're not walking straight enough. You need to jerk the slack out of your life and start loving God more than you love yourself. If you ain't got a man or woman of God like that, you need to run. Either that or they need to run because you're keeping them in check. Excuse me, I didn't say that out loud, did I? Okay. <laughs> I got to get done. Let me hurry up. Say hurry up, Pastor. Hurry up. I'll take that over the rest of y'all. Amen. <laughs> Here's what they said. Here's what they said, verse 11. It says the gods... The gods have become like humans. You see that little G, right? It says the, the, the gods have become like humans. In other words, when they walked into a situation that needed fixing by the power of the Holy Ghost, they were sensitive enough, not concerned what the, about the, what the liberals were going to think or the independents were going to think or the overly conservatives, ultra conservatives who say that healing is not for today. They just simply walked in, saw a knee, said in the name of Jesus, stand up on your feet. And this man just stood up because his spirit had to respond because he heard the power of the voice of God for the first time in his life. And we wonder why our churches are so weak. It starts right here. Now it would be easy to blame you and say you don't pray enough for me or for your leaders. That's a lie. If anybody gonna pray for me, it needs to be me. That's where it starts. Now you do your share, but in my prayer for me, I'm also praying for you and you praying for me. So with that being said, these guys, they're so astonished at what happened. They say that the gods have become like humans or taken a human form. And this is what they say. They have come down to us. They had no concept of who God really was. I'm not a fearful person, but I will tell you this by the Spirit of the Lord. That there's coming a day in many cities and communities across our nation that people, when they hear or sense or get in the presence of God, they won't even know what it is. Churches are, are shriveling on the vine. Some of them are shriveling on the vine and got thousands of people in them. Full of, full of they're like whitewashed sepulchers, Jesus would call them, Matthew 12. Full of dead men's bones. Because it has become an entertainment industry. And if I don't have lions and tigers and bears on the stage, oh my. Y'all don't, don't know they do that? I know it ain't just ain't in Texas and New York. They do that. They do that. I'm sure they do it around here somewhere. Because they got to keep your attention. And you know why they have to keep your attention? Okay, I guess I got to use my last one now. Pull your religious toes in. Because in, we are so underdeveloped in our souls that we can't even stand to watch with God for one hour. Listen, listen, listen. There's a, listen, there's a difference in being in the house and being attentive to the house. When I'm at home, when I'm at home, listen, you know that you're telling the truth. When I'm at home, and it's just me and my wife, we're empty nesters, okay? I know when somebody's in my house. And, and I also, I had, I, I had an odd thing happen to me the other day, but I know, I know, I know what happened. But I had my, my bedroom door open, and my dog, he just a little guy, he just a little floofy dog, got a big floofy white tail, you know. I walk around the neighborhood, big tall black guy with a little floofy dog. People say, oh, he's so sweet. I'm like, you got teeth too, just be, be, be aware. Okay, no, he don't bite. He don't bite, I'm just kidding. And, and so, so anyway, so, so the dog was laying in his bed. I was sitting on the bed and she was in her office and I knew where she was. And I sensed somebody walking up the stairs. I just kind of sensed it. I didn't see it. But then, you know how I knew it? Because both he, the dog and I both looked up at the same time. I know what's going on in my house. Many of us don't know what's going on in our own houses. And I'm not talking about that big palatial place you have, those 33 acres with the pool and the pond. You know, I'm describing my place one day. But I'm just saying, you know, whatever yours is. Because my, my house is going to have water on it. 
because I am a catcher. I go catch him. Do we have any fishermen or fisherwomen in the house? Raise your fishing hands. Y'all doing it wrong. You're supposed to be catching. You'll get it later. Anyway, but many of us don't know what's going on in this house. We don't know what has creeped on board and brought contaminants and pollutants with it. Because we watch pornography or we open ourselves up to illicit movies. They got this, 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 this that, look, I ain't knocking TV. So did I use my last one? I didn't use it yet. I didn't, I said I was going to. I didn't. Okay, thank you. I, I'm, I'm trusting y'all to be right. Okay. Anyway, anyway, they got this movie and I'm not, I'm, I'm going to be careful here because I'm not bashing anybody. But they used to have a movie, uh, a show called America's, America's Funniest Home Videos. Y'all remember that? AFV? They got a new one out. Anybody know what I'm talking about? See, because I watch the news. I don't watch the news for good news. I watch the news to stay informed so I can stand up here and tell y'all what's really going on out there. And this movie is called uh, 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 America After Dark or something like that. Keep your kids away from it. And I'm going to tell you something else. You need to keep your eyes off it too. Oh, I better hurry up because... It, 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 see, see what, what happens is we are, we are now becoming desensitized and, and, Paul and Paul and Barnabas, were, they were locked in. They were zoned in on God. They weren't allowing themselves to be distracted because they knew what was in their house. They took inventory. Say, take inventory. Ooh, and when they were ready to get, get this man, Jesus was ready to get, uh, the Holy Ghost was ready to get this man delivered, they were up for the task. Let me finish up so I can get out of your way. Then the people began, verse 12, to call Barnabas Zeus, or the main god of the Greek pantheon, and Paul Hermes. He was the Greek God who delivered messages. Some of y'all know this. Because he was the main speaker. They thought Paul was Hermes, okay? Verse 13 says, the priest in the temple of Zeus, which was nearby, listen to me now, nearby the city brought some bulls and flowers and wreaths to the gates. Why did he do this? Because he and the people wanted to offer a sacrifice to Paul and Barnabas. The symbolism here of the church, not every church, not y'all that's in here, not these men of God, women of God, I know that, and, and y'all. But the, this, this thing has gotten twisted somehow. Where now all of a sudden, the main attraction is the pastor, is, is, the, is the evangelist. Oh, help me God, I gotta be careful here. It, it is the praise and worship leader or all of the instruments. That, that's the main attraction and somehow or another, we cannot draw a crowd to prayer. And when the, when the service is going on, we want the main attraction to give it to us. Give it to us. Feed us. But see, I'm not here to feed you as much as you are required to feed yourself. I only get you one hour a week, Robin. Well, maybe hour and a half, but you know what I'm saying. Some of y'all get that later. But... What are you doing the rest of the week? Amen. What are you doing in the time that it really matters? They used to tell us at Heritage of Faith at JSMI, they used to say that, that, that preparation time is never wasted time. Amen. Don't you want to be used by God? Yes. You got to get ready. Tell your neighbor, get ready. get ready. So they ran in among the people shouting. Paul and Barnabas heard about it. They tore their clothes. They ripped them off. They ran in among the people shouting, friends. Why are you doing these things? We are only human beings. Like you, we are bringing you the good news and are telling you, turn away from these worthless things and turn to the living God. That's the same thing Paul preached over in Galatians 4.8. He says, he is the one who made the sky, the earth, the sea, and everything in them. We know that about God, amen? So he goes on. Let me skip down a little bit. Oh, Jesus. You can read it for yourself, though. In 19, we see that some Jews opposed them that had opposed them in Iconium had now made their way to where they were preaching. And they brought division. And I'm going to say this to everybody so you all can hear it. There are, many, there are many perpetrators in the body of Christ. They look the part. They even know the lingo. 
If the Bible says that Satan can, can even transform himself into an angel of light, don't you think for one minute that you can't be fooled by people that come in saying they want to be a part of you, but they are really sent there to bring division in the house? And if you have not paid pastors, leaders, if you have not made proper preparation of your house and taken inventory before they show up, their agenda is made easier because you have been lazy and negligent in your duty. And if your ministry falls apart, it is not God's fault. God's not in the business of shutting them down, not unless they ain't preaching the truth, but you know what I'm saying? Okay? So he says here, as the division came, says, verse 20 says, but the followers gathered around him after he had been dragged and left for dead. He got up and went back into the town. Look at this man. The next day, he and Barnabas left and went to the city of Derby. Paul and Barnabas, 21, told the good news. They preached the gospel in Derby, and many became followers. Paul and Barnabas returned to Lystra, Iconium, Antioch, making the followers of Jesus say stronger. stronger. Glory to God. Verse 22. Your Bible, if it's a King James, may say confirming. Does it say that? Confirming the saints, the souls. And what we're called here to do tonight, why, the reason why Dr. Savell was coming, the reason why Apostle Roberts came, is to confirm and strengthen the saints. I'm going to tell you something about great ministry. God has really blessed me in being able to be around some. And for that, I remember one time, I remember the time uh, I was uh, at a, at a uh, Tex, over, Thunder Over Texas motorcycle rally that, that Dr. Savell used to run consistently every year. And they, I was standing at a tent, a gentleman by the name of Kenny Cable was with me, uh, who, who his wife happens to be Dr. Savell's secretary now. But we were standing there, and we were just waiting, kind of hanging out. And my team was on the other side. I don't know why I was just standing there, but I was waiting. And I had to believe it was the Holy Ghost. Because as I'm standing there, somebody says to me, hey, you, come here. And you, Kenny, was standing there. Come here. He said, I need some help baptizing some folks. It was Kenny Copeland. Yeah, that's what I said. Mm. But I didn't say it quite like that. I said, oh. So he's all pleasant, polite. He says, boys, we got this. God's going to do some good stuff. So we stood there. Kenny and I stood there. And, hey, I had to make sure I was paying attention to the person, not looking at Brother Copeland because I didn't want to drown him. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> but it set something, it set something, because that's the man, that, through that tape he gave me, that's how I'm here today. So to meet him in person was a great honor. But he's just a man. He's short little something, too. I'm just going to tell you that. <laughs> but Jerry's short, too. Call him Brother Jesse, but he's still short. That's what he, that's what he would say. <laughs> short man in the front said, don't say nothing about short folks. I'm just kidding. Anyway, y'all all right, let me finish. Can I just have about five more minutes? Is that okay? I got to let you go. But he says here, he goes on. It says, and then... Uh, verse 22 says, making the followers of Jesus stronger. That's why Dr. Savell was coming. Yeah. Strengthening the souls of the lives of the disciples. How many disciples we have in here? Yeah. Yeah. God never called converts. He never called converts. He never called converts. I ain't getting no amens. Let me try this side of the house. He never called converts. He didn't call you to make a convert. He called you to make disciples. But in order to make a disciple, you got to be a disciple. Amen. Amen. Isn't that right? So you reproduce yourself with somebody else. But if you're running around to, to, to switching churches every six months. Okay. Pull your religious toes in. I should have said it before. I should have said it before. Is that four? Is that four? Father, forgive me. I repent. Brother, brother, <laughs> brother. Brother Copeland told us, he told, Brother Copeland told us, you, you probably heard it, Brother Copeland told us we, he was at a minister's conference in, in Fort Worth in, uh, in uh, at Dr. Savell's place, and he said, listen, you know, Brother Copeland had that, you know, I, I got to try it because I ain't never done it before intentionally. How many, how many of y'all know who Brother Copeland is? Okay, if you don't, Google, BVOVN something, okay, YouTube. That's a good thing to watch on YouTube. He gets that Copeland stance. Oh. I can't even do it right. Because I'm a little too tall to be doing it like, you know. <laughs> Brothers, he's talking ministers and sisters. Ministers of the gospel, if you say you're going to be there at 5 o'clock, be there at 10 minutes till. Don't be there at 5 o'clock. 
He said, at least you come at five. That's five. But those of you that come at 505, you have told a five minute lie. <laughs> Wouldn't he say that? That's exactly what he said. So I lied on my, on my, I, I pulled my, yeah, I, I can't take it back, so I repent. Let's look at this last passage of scripture and I'm going to let you go. Let's look at this last passage of scripture. I was doing all that to get here. <clears throat> Making the followers of Jesus stronger, verse 22, and helping them what? Stay, God help me, in the faith. Yeah, yeah. 22. Making the followers of Jesus Oh, I got, oh, who put them, I didn't tell you to put the message up yet. Who put that message translation up there? Who am I going to have to fire? You're fired. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. She, she was a little ahead of me. I got it right here, but I didn't tell her. You, 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 you God, girl, you keep going. That's a disciple back there. I know that to be true. So, so I'm going to read it from the message translation. Verse 22, but it's got 21 and 22 together. After proclaiming the message in Derby and establishing a strong core of disciples. Do we have a strong core of disciples in this house tonight? You don't have to be a part of Life Point. You're part of the body of Christ. Amen? Amen. Other folks are doing different things on Sunday night. Most churches don't even have service on Sunday nights anymore. Right. We only have it once a month, first Sunday of the month. They retraced their steps to Lystra, then Iconium, and then Antioch. What did they do? They go, went back to the places that they were beat up in. You want to tell a real disciple, a real Holy Ghost warrior for the Lord? Go to the place where they treated you despitefully. Yeah. Go to the place where they told you you better not preach in Jesus' name here. Go to the place where they say, well, we don't want your kind here. That's the very place that God needs you to be because somebody in the crowd needs to know Jesus. Yeah. And these two picked up on it, man, and they said that they retraced their steps and then Antioch, they, what did they do? My Bible just went away. <laughs> they, they were putting muscle, putting muscle and sinew in the lives of the disciples. In other words, they were building them up from the inside out. They had become Holy Ghost champions for the Lord. And now all of a sudden, when they were weak, these people had been weak and, and had been without God and didn't know anything about God. They come in telling people the truth, which I'm doing to you tonight. Brother Jerry would do the same thing. Apostle Roberts did it this morning. I'm telling you the truth, baby. There's no life but the life of faith in God that works. So they put sinew and muscle in the lives of the disciples, urging them to stick with it. Tell your neighbor, stick with it. Come on, tell them, say, stick with it. And then he says what they had begun to believe and not quit, making it clear to them, keep going, give me the next one, that it what? That it wouldn't be easy. God, help me. Anyone signing up for the kingdom of God has to go through plenty of hard times. I am so amazed. Close your Bibles. Close your Bibles. I am so amazed at people who say they want a part of the kingdom of God and they don't want to stick with it. They get, they get feelings hurt. My God. Oh, they, they, they're so immature on the soulless realm, but when you try to get them built up in faith, they don't want to hear it. You, you, you write books, they don't read them. You make CDs, they don't listen to them. You have prayer, they on the outside instead of being on the inside. And what God has called us to do is to strengthen disciples because you know what? You're going to get out here and you're going to feel like quitting. I know me, I feel like quitting way too many times, but there's a strength in me that came from people like you. Jesus. One of Dr. Savell's favor, he says, I'm the apostle of stand. He says, having done all to stand, stand therefore. He's like, I'm no quit Jerry. One of his greatest messages is, I said it last week, I couldn't remember. Oh, God, it just slipped my mind again. It must not be something for me to say. But, 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 but in, the man, in the message, he stands up. He says, this might be the, the greatest battle of your life. You might have come in here with no hope, but just, just this last opportunity to be in the presence of God. You should come in with, look, like the man whose ankles in his could not walk from the birth of, of his body. God sending somebody to say something to you. It might just be a smile it might where's my brother where's my hug brother stand up hug brother it might just be a hug that you need no 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 you missed it you got to come give me a hug my god I, it might just be a hug come on somebody but god's got what you need in the house but you can't get it if you don't come Ooh, god. And, and, and you got people you got people who are, t who, are, who are quitting, I, 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 I just, I'm trying to, my mind just doesn't, doesn't compute this part of it. They ask for patience, and when they ask for, I'm praying for patience, 
The Bible says that let patience have her perfect work in you. James 1, he says, listen, that the trying of your faith might be of God. You got to understand that if you pray for patience, God's going to allow tests, trials, and temptations to come to you. How else you going to get patience? Here, take my cup of patience. It don't work like that. And I'm just, I'm just absolutely stymied sometimes when people say I'm a person of faith. But the moment the bill collector calls, they act like their phone don't work no more. And if you're going to be people of faith, you got to be people of your word. You know, it'd be bad if they call, they call and they want to talk to Tommy Roberts. I said, get the phone, honey. I don't feel like talking to him. She like, I, see, I was about to be bad. I can't. That ain't what she'd say. If it was she and I, y'all all right. I can't, I ain't got no more to use. I gave them all away. But she would say to me, black man, get that phone. Y'all laugh if you want to. She would. Because I'm the man of the house. Huh? I'm a faith man. And we got people proclaiming they faith giants. But the moment, the Bible says that if your faith fails in the day of adversity, then it is weak. But your faith comes from your trust in God and hearing and hearing the word of God. If you don't hear the words, you ain't going to have no faith. Well, I watch, uh, I watch my church's BVOVN. No, it ain't. You need to repent. Oh. Well, I don't have a church. Find one. Somebody out there looking for some partners, some members. Somebody out here preaching the word, man. Well, that's too far. I told you, we drove two and a half hours one way. Well, that's you. Exactly. My last story. Who said that? What did she say? You, you, amen. Amen. He, 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 I, told, I, told, I told your story over here in, in, on the way to church tonight when you told me a few weeks ago, it's been a couple months ago since you started coming, and you said that you didn't have a ride to get here. What, do you remember what you told me? Yeah, Tell, say it out loud. I was going to work on my semi-tractor and I was going to drive it here. Y'all hear that? You, you hear that? That's hungry. That's hungry. That's hungry. Come on, y'all, 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 y'all. Y'all let a good pass, good opportunity to say amen and pass you by. Last story. I could go on all night, but I'm not. Dr. Savelle tells a story. I remember this. I didn't try this part because I just wasn't there yet. You can't do everything you hear somebody else say. You got to listen to the voice of the Holy Ghost. He'll tell you what to do. I remember when, when I was, I, I, knew, I had, knew I was called to, to uh, full-time ministry, but I didn't have full-time faith. And at the time, I just gotten out of the service, and I was I was uh, marketable, and I knew that I was going to be good for somebody's company. Problem was, didn't nobody else know it, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so I couldn't find a job. Remember that big white house we lived in over there in East Spencer? We had we had we had seventeen people. Was it seventeen? Seventeen people living where we had just gotten born again. We had seventeen people living in our house. 17. Top that one. Because we love Jesus. And we thought everybody else did. Because they said they did. And I was too ignorant, too underdeveloped to know that wasn't the wisdom of God. You know what we did? It was a big house too. You remember that house? It was a big house too. I mean, it was big. Best house in the neighborhood actually. And, 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 and so when the lease was up, she and I moved, left everybody in that house. Y'all can have it. There wasn't no peace there. There was strife there. And many of us don't understand that the Bible says where there's strife, there's also confusion and every evil word. You, can, you ain't going to get nothing from God if you run around arguing with your husband, calling her every name but a child of God. Anyway, let me, uh, okay. That didn't cost you nothing, but a little more, a few moments. So, so I got dressed with, I only had one little half pipe suit because I never wore a suit. I didn't care about a suit for it. I was in the service, man. And so I put on that little suit, and I told her, I had her brother Copeland said too. He said he went in there and was going to give eight hours a day to the Lord. 
Bless God. I heard him. I heard him when he said it. I put that suit on. I don't even remember if I had shoes on. I probably had no shoes on at the time because I didn't own none, but I might have had some tennis shoes. It didn't matter. I went in there and got my notes and was taking notes and was watching what was on TV. One of the first times I had ever heard Joyce Meyer. Oh, help me now. Here we go. Here we go. Here we go. Joyce Meyer said that I was doing Bible studies and I was still smoking. Some of y'all would have said that disqualifies her. I ain't going to her stinky breath Bible, Bible study. But I'm going to tell y'all a little secret that all y'all little super spiritual selves need to hear. God ain't so much concerned about what you do as your motive for doing it. I'm not advocating smoking. Don't go out. My, the people that come here know I talk about this all the time. If you can show me somewhere in the Bible where it says that smoking is sin, I will underline it in my Bible and retract everything I've ever said. Well, Romans 12 says that does not say the same thing. We have made a doctrine out of something that, and see what God was doing, he didn't care about her smoking. He knew that at some point he was going, she was going to lose that. Because in order for her to get up here and get thousands upon thousands upon thousands of women coming to St. Louis to hear her speak, she's going to have to let go of some things. And in order for you to really walk where God wants you to walk, you're going to have to let some things go. How bad do you want to see victory in your house? So anyway, I did that little thing. That didn't work. I tried it. Copeland said, it tried you in one. I, I, had to, I had to have a job, man. I mean, I needed some money. And I didn't have enough faith to figure out how to get it. If I had started sewing, I didn't know that yet. So anyway, I heard Brother Jerry tell this story. I'm going to tell it in my closing. He said, and some of you have heard this, and I may not tell it exactly like you would tell it, but I'm preaching, not you, so hush. <laughs> he was standing there. He, had, he was trying to get the word in him. And he had been so undisciplined. If you've ever heard the story of Jerry Savelle, painting body man, owned his own paint body shop, had his cigarettes in his pocket, went to hear Brother Copeland preach, you know, and had his, his wife, Miss Carolyn, and mother-in-law in there. They, and, and it's so cool to know these people in the stories, you know, and not just talk about it. But they were in there praying for him. And he's, he's all frustrated because God is working on him. Some of, some of our frustrations because God is trying to change your zip code. He's trying to change where you live it. If God can't change your mind, he can't change what you drive. So, so, so he's there, and I'm, I'm preempting it, but he's there, and he's trying to get the word in. Where am I standing? Anybody know? Standing on the sides of a bathtub. He said, I got sleepy, but I knew if I went to sleep, I was going to get wet. Huh? He wasn't scared of getting wet, but he didn't want to get wet. When the, the time to get wet is when you take the bath. Amen. Other than that, you stand your ground. That's why he said, I'm the apostle of stand. Jesus. Huh? My God. So he's standing. TJ, what is that message? I cannot remember it. Called to battle, destined to win. Has anybody in here heard that? If you have not, you have not heard Jerry Savelle preach. <laughs> My, isn't that a good message? That is a great message. Now, there should be a, a thousand hits on YouTube tonight for that one. Call to battle, destined to win. I can see him with, with his, and I love him because I remember watching him preach when we were in Green Bay and he was preaching. He was like, you, um, you might be in the, you know, he's left-handed, excuse me. You might be in the, ain't he? You might be in the best, worst battle you ever been in your life. That is not the time to quit. Hey, Satan, I'm saying just like Satan, Satan is taking his best shot. He's blessed. He tried to shoot you down. But when at the end, you and God will still be standing. That's what he did. Oh, yeah. Preached that at Bishop Butler's church. Anyway, he's standing on the bathtub. And all the while, while he's standing, he was crippled. But God was adding sinew. Y'all ain't know what I'm saying. He was adding strength to the feet. He just thought he was standing, but without the feet, you can't stand. God help me. You got to have a good foundation in order to do what God wants you to do. So he's standing. And as he's standing, he, he thinks he's getting weak and his legs are tired and they're probably aching and cramping. And he wants to so quick. But God said, boy, I, look, you're not standing by yourself. I'm right here with you. When you thought 
The Bible says that, that when in your weakness, his strength is made perfect, Paul said. So he's standing there getting strong. And here it is 50 years later, no scandal, same wife, ain't never done nothing that anybody could criticize, always a giver, loving God, traveling all over the world, got his own airplane. How dare you think you know something when you don't know nothing? But I'm telling you that if you will let God use you, you can have the same thing. Stand to your feet. I don't believe in preachers with airplanes. Don't worry, you won't ever have one. You ain't got to worry. Had somebody tell me, uh, came to our first, one of our first services over in Tiffin. You know, I was blessed. I've been blessed, man. I've been blessed. This man set me on a good foundation. And uh, I remember I was working. I just started working at the ministry there. And uh, in working there, had a guy who had been a student there. I won't mention his name because I know some, some, of y'all, some of the people in here know this man. He is a tall, tall guy, real tall. And I didn't, I'd seen him, and I'm like, you know, I'm just getting there, so I'm like, wow, this guy goes to JSMI, and this guy works here. You know how you do, right? When you get there first time, you're like, ooh, you know, ooh. And so, so but I, I took a road trip with him. You don't really know anybody until you take a road trip with him. Yep. Huh? Do that with your, with your wife. You better make sure you got all bases covered, baby. You'll have plenty of time to get it right. Anyway, I was on a road trip with this guy. We were going to move some furniture, and I was just working in the department. He wasn't even working for the ministry. He was a volunteer. But he told me, he said, my dream, listen to me, my dream is to preach at Heritage of Faith. You know people like that. You know people like that. Rubbing up, trying to push up against Brother Jerry. You know, look, c- c- come here. Let me borrow both y'all. Just stand right, stand close together, okay? Now, you, Brother Jerry, and you just, you just his, his Tony, Who's, his, who's, who's watching him. They will try to do this just to get bro- next to Brother Jerry and Miss Carolyn. Will they not? Like Brother Jerry and Miss Carolyn got something to give you more than Jesus. Can't Brown knows nobody. Huh? God gives, the Bible says promotion comes what? Not from the east or the west. It comes from the Lord. Yes, thank you. Anyway, so, so, so we were there and this brother... <laughs> I, I didn't know anybody, so I wasn't saying nothing. I was a passenger in the back, and they were driving and everything. And I started listening to what he was saying. And he let it be known that his dream was to do that. And I'm going to tell you, he did do it. But not long after that, he was gone from the ministry because he had fulfilled his dream. What is your dream? Don't let your dream, uh, don't let your dream be so small that you can fulfill it in one moment. Many dreams can be... All I want to do is get married. You married now. Now what you going to do for the next 40 years? Switch wives? Switch husbands? Oh, I want to be married again. Don't know. Okay, let me stop. Anyway, so, so he, he got up there that Wednesday night, and it was a big thing for him to preach. You're talking about shallow into the pool. <laughs> and I thought to myself, you, you done fulfilled your destiny. I don't know what you're going to do from here on out. Now, why am I saying that? I'm not saying that to brag. Please hear me. I'm not saying that to brag. I ain't asked for nothing. Whatever we got, I did not, we did not ask for. We got called out because God wanted us called out. And I'm here to tell you, man, I, you know, when I, I, and you know how I got called out? You know where, where I got called out? In prayer. Prayer. Bando sekiria mando shiadeste. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, God is the one who fulfills. God is the one who empowers. God is the one who starts the work and finishes the work and performs the work in you and I. God alone, him and him alone, his name is Jesus. He is the only sacrifice for our sins. He is the only one that can get you from the beginning to the end. In the name of Jesus. I remember the first time they asked me to preach. They were going out of town. Family was going out of town. They were going to Pennsylvania. And they asked me to preach. I was so nervous, man. I was nervous. 500, 600 people in the auditorium. And they ain't never heard this little black boy preach before. He knew what was in me. Many times other people know what's in you and you don't even know what's in you. Amen. Talking down to yourself. Man, I stood up there. I was nervous. They couldn't tell the difference. I was standing up there like I knew something. Didn't know nothing. Could preach everything I knew in 15 minutes. Y'all see that don't happen now, right? <laughs> but I preached. Yeah. I mean, I preached. I knew, I knew that it was, it was Jerry Savelle's house. 
And he wasn't going to bring anybody up there to preach. He could pick, he could pick any number of preachers. You, you guys know I, I, he could pull anybody. He said, but I want you to preach today. I stood there, knees knocking, sweat rolling down the inside of my pants. <laughs> Folks couldn't tell the difference because I was, thus saith the Lord, and this is God, and that's God. And next thing you know, by the time we got done, we had an altar call. People were laid out. And, and for, the, for the great God in me, I had enough sense to know that it was not me. I'm going to say this because I hear the Holy Spirit say it. And that's the only time I've ever said this publicly. I know you know what I'm getting ready to say. And I sense the Lord telling me this. It is not for any reason other than the Lord is telling me to share this. I have never shared. We've never shared this publicly. We were sitting in, hey, darling. We were sitting in Dr. Savelle's office shortly after our daughter went home to be with the Lord. The whole family was in there. They called everybody together. And Miss Savelle, she's a prayer warrior. She began to pray. She began to pray in the Holy Ghost. They were on the plane going to South Carolina. They're on their way back. And they said that we need somebody to take over our youth. And so they began to cry out. They don't just say it. They live it. And sure enough, they said, who, she said, who is Tommy and Lynette? She didn't never met us. Didn't know us. Who is Tommy? Don't you know God can drop something? Oh, my God, help me. Man, 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 God can drop the right stock to buy just because you listen. God can give you the right investment. He can give you the right business idea. All you got to do is listen. And so, so, so she found out who we were. They called us into their office. And we were sitting in there. And, 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 and I'm saying it in public now, so it don't matter. But I'm not saying it for any benefit of myself, but the Holy Spirit's told me to say it. So, in there, he, so we were in there talking, and Dr. Bell was sharing some very personal things. I will not share those. I will only share the part he said to me in this particular instance. He said, Tommy, I see you. He said, I see you on the same platform as me preaching side by side. He said, I see the day coming. Now, listen, here's what else he said. But it's up to you to believe for it. Mm-hmm. So, so, so I know this much. I would have never thought that I had to preach in his stead. But if that man called just like him, I had to go to Texas to help him. I do the same thing for him. I do the same thing for you as long as you ain't trying to con me. And I ain't going to let you con me. I ain't nobody's dummy. Plus, I got the Holy Ghost inside. It ain't going to happen anyway. And sure enough, he called. I'm there. He might say this. Let me see who I can pick. See how spiritual you are. He used, to he used to tell us, Miss Carolyn be up there. Service be high. He would say, so-and-so, I feel like running. <laughs> and he didn't run. If he called your name, it was your turn to run. <laughs> Sitting right on the front row. <laughs> Caleb, I feel like running. <laughs> Come on now. I feel like running. Come on, somebody. Come on, somebody. Come on, somebody. Glory to God. God. Now, I ain't tell him to run twice. I'm just saying. I didn't feel like running twice. <laughs> See? See? Running. Running. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Oh, my God. What am I saying? Time to grow up. Grow up on the inside, y'all. I know you got more degrees than a thermometer. That's great. You got intellect that would wow the people that you stand before as a professor, as a doctor, as a teacher. All those things are good. They are great. They're good accomplishments. You are a businessman. You are wealthy. You are all these things. But are you submitted to God? Can God use you to go, go take out somebody's trash? I was visiting a, a partner's house not too long ago, and they, they had let trash accumulate in their house, and I could smell it when I walked in the door. And so I didn't have to ask them. When I got ready to leave, the Lord said, take that trash with you when you go. Four bags of trash, threw them in the back of my Jeep, and the man said, no, 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 no. My pastor don't take out no trash. I said, back up off me now. <laughs> I said, I'm a son first. I'll be a pastor too, mm -hmm. but give me that trash. Mm -hmm. Why? Because I know what God's going to do. Right. There may be a time when I need somebody to take out the trash. Right. Let's lift their hands before the Lord. Amen. Father, we give you praise.